Oops, I missed one. Got to make sure I'm pushing all the right buttons. And sometimes I always don't do. And ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Louis B. Free Radio Show, Brain Food from the Heartland, an extended Louis B. Free Radio Show today. And I am absolutely delighted and honored to have as my guest, Dr. Wingerhoes, who has been on a number of times, and yet you're, you're still very gracious in coming back, Doc, with me, suffering my madness, I guess I should say. Well, I very much appreciate it to be your guest. Uh, I, I also feel very honored. <laughs> well, of, well, thank you for that. It's the honor, believe me, the honor is all the honor is all mine, all mine. I, so many things I want to talk with you about, about tears and, and some of the things obviously we've talked about before, but for new listeners, I want to make sure they're up to where we're at with the discussion. So tell us a little bit about your path. Why, did, why a PhD? Take me back. Okay, yeah, I'm a psychologist. And um, uh, for my PhD work, I uh, studied uh, stress, especially also the the psycho neuroendocrinology <laughs> difficult word <laughs> so uh, hormones how stress influenced our hormones and we were also at the beginning the early years of uh, the study of uh, the influence of stress on uh, our immune functioning um and uh, but after my phd i became involved in an international uh, study on on emotions so that that was really pioneer work it was one of the first uh, uh studies international studies on uh the occurrence and the context of uh everyday emotions uh, like anger sadness uh joy and so on and um uh, at that time, I was uh, at the party and one of the other guests approached me and uh, he said, uh, Ad, you should know that. Uh, I read that uh, crying is healthy. Do you believe that crying is healthy? And I said, well, that that's question surprised me. And uh, but I found it an interesting question. And I, mm. uh, I said, yeah, I don't know. I have no answer. I, I absolutely don't know what the scientific literature uh, says about that. But um, I will try to look it up. And um, well, I started a search. Uh, in the scientific literature and I couldn't find any relevant literature. So uh, I was uh, telling that to a colleague and then there were some stu students who were overhearing us and uh, they said, well, well, we are searching for a research project. Uh, maybe then we are more, the very first to do such a study. And so that, that was the very beginning. So we did a very simple study. But then um, a few years later, I uh, wa was, was watching uh, uh, a sentimental movie. We, we call it a B movie here in the Netherlands. <laughs> it was uh, uh, based on, on true facts, uh, uh, an American movie um, in which a, a teenage girl who had cancer uh, she was hospitalized and uh, her father was not allowed from, from his uh, employee, employer to visit her. If he would do that, then he would lose his job. And um, so uh, the teenager was very angry with that. And she approached the uh, Make Me a Wish Foundation and she said that she wanted to see the president, uh, Bill Clinton, or the, uh, to talk about this. And uh, so then there is a scene in that movie that uh, Bill Clinton, who uh, plays himself in that movie, who re receives that girl in the, the Oval Office. And he says something like, uh, well, this is the famous Oval Office. And I receive here very important people from all over the world. But the most important, that's you. And at that moment, I started crying. I, and I was yeah. completely overwhelmed. I was not aware what was happening there. But then afterwards, I, I wondered, it seems as if 
I ha my body has a certain knowledge that I'm not aware of that that this issue that a father is not allowed to visit a, a, a very sick child child in the hospital that that make much impact on me and and I was not aware of it that that I found so fascinating and that triggered me to uh, to to try to do some more research on on the importance uh, of crying and what also helped was that i think that was a few months later or so i read the uh, book of uh, charles darwin uh, he has not only written about uh, uh, evolution but he has also writ written a very interesting book uh the expression of emotions in man and animals and there he in that book he asserts that emotions and the expression of it are very important to our welfare but he also added that in his view emotional tears do not serve any purpose and so that was quite a challenge for me as a researcher to try to prove that darwin at least in this respect was wrong so <laughs> And and you have been doing that for decades now. And what what yeah, what, yeah. what is that? What, what what how you proved Darwin wrong? Correct. Yeah, I think that uh, we are at least very close to it. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that. He said they serve um, no purpose. Yeah. Well, um, so, so uh, we started initially with, with um, the idea. The, the question of uh, uh, that I uh, received on that part if I'm, is crying healthy? Does has crying any beneficial mood uh, aspects? And um, um, so that that learned us to make a long story short. Uh, one of the things that we did was we arranged a, 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 an international project, international study of adult crying, in which. Uh, investigators from 37 countries uh, collaborated and we collected data from uh, over 5,000 uh, uh, participants who uh, uh, provided information among others about their last crying episode. And so we asked them what happened, even what time was it, we, who was with you, where were you, uh, how did uh, bystanders respond to your tears, how did you feel after the crying, what kind of emotions did you experience, and so on, and so on. And um, um, from that study, we learned that exactly 50% of, of the respondents uh, uh, reported a mood improvement, so a benefit, a beneficial effect of crying on the mood. And 40% said that there was no change, and 10% said that they felt worse. And um, then we did another study in which we tried to find out which factors might uh, predict um, um, might determine whether or not people report a beneficial effect of crying or no change or even a, a worsening of the effect. And that research that uh, yielded uh, three important factors. The first one was uh, the mental shape of the crier. Um, a bit to our surprise, we learned that people who uh, who suffer from depression or burnout, they cry more than the average, but they hardly, if ever, report that they feel better after having cried. So actually, those who need it most, they do not uh, mm -hmm. benefit from it. So that, that was also all, uh, a surprising result. The second factor was the specific antecedent of the crying. And we, we, we make the global distinction between controllable situations, uh, for example, a conflict situation, and uncontrollable situation, like the passing away of a significant other. And we learned that uh, crying benefits are 
mainly reported in the case of controllable situations and and only seldom in uncontrol after uncontrollable situations crying over uncontrollable situations and the third factor was how others so bystanders react to your crying your to your tears if they react with uh, understanding and they provide comfort and support yes then then you feel better but if they become angry or they start laughing at you uh, and, and you feel embarrassed then people do not uh, uh, respond any uh, with, with with a positive uh, uh, do not experience any positive effects of their crying so that already made us wonder um well is it really about the crying uh, is that the main factor that determines how we feel or is it just the recept or the receipt of uh, social support and so um this already was a first indication that maybe the the uh, um, the importance of crying should be looked for not in the that that has an immediate kind of catharsis like effect but rather that it has an effect on others on bystanders and that they are uh, uh, generally speaking more willing to provide you with support and that the positive effects of what we think crying actually are the positive effects of the receipt of of comfort and and social support uh, and that reasoning was further strengthened when we uh, had another study in which we compared the well-being and also other aspects of people who had not cried for 15 years so one five and who and we compared this group with a group of normal criers and we didn't see any difference in their well-being the groups are similar in their well-being but um the the criers the normal criers uh differed from the non-criers in that they were more empathic uh, they felt more connected with others and they reported more the reception of more social support so again another indication that it's especially how others react to your tears that that determines how you feel after a crying episode and from then on we started so more with okay if if we expose people to crying a person so or pictures of crying persons so we had a, a series of photographs uh, of crying people and we removed the tears digitally so that we had exactly the same pictures this. with okay. and without tears and uh, then we asked them uh, to what extent people were willing to provide them with support how uh whether they liked this guy whether they, uh, whether they felt that he was reliable and so on and so on and that learned us that research that um so the people when people were depicted with tears they were perceived as uh, more empathic more warmer more reliable more honest and um and so that that were good reasons why we like to connect with these people um, so that that's where we are now and um, um, yeah one of the uh, last studies that we did was okay if people uh, think that a, someone who cries is more reliable and is more honest and is more a, 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 an individual who's tend to uh, be more uh, uh, to be a good person so to say that that's our uh, one of the last studies that we did and in that study we showed that indeed that 
people who report that they are more willing to cry, that they have a higher crying proneness, so to say, that they are more willing to spend in a very boring task with which they can uh, uh, deserve money that's not for themselves, but they had that money that they had to donate to charity. So with you, with the research, your research continues. Again, I'm going all over the place today, Dr. Fingerhoes. Where are things for you now? Um, yeah, so I think that we have now uh, quite good evidence that uh, Darwin was wrong and, and that uh, the mayor function of crying must be searched in the in the interpersonal domain it's a strong stimulus to others that it's a strong call for for support it's it's it, it's clear indication i need you you must help me and uh, and yeah i i don't think that whereas in the past many people especially also in the clinical field felt that uh, crime may just feel better because it is it caused a kind of catharsis effect that that's no longer uh no i think that's obsolete that view and uh, we what we also did by the way recently we did two studies in which we, uh, because the idea about the catharsis was also, okay, suppose that crying has a positive effect on, on our mood. What are the mechanisms? And one of the proposed mechanisms what that was that crying would stimulate in our brain the release of substances like endorphins or oxytocin, and, but that are also uh, substances that have an impact on our pain threshold. So what we did, in, uh, that's what we recently published, we uh, exposed people, uh, so uh, study participants, to a sad movie, and then we exposed them to a pain stimulus. So we measured that pain threshold. And so we wondered whether crying would have a positive effect on the on the crying press out with other words that it would reduce the pain sensation but we didn't find that in two studies even if it had an effect it was even the reverse the opposite um, if there is an effect it seems that crying had a, a, a negative effect on pain perception so it made this worse Whereas other studies have showed that um, swearing and, and laughing, that that has a positive effect on the pain perception. <laughs> swearing. <laughs> so so okay. rather than crying when, we, when we've when we experienced physical pain, we, we, we can rather better swear or, or laugh. And <laughs> <how's that? laughs> swearing. I love that you had swearing in there. I'm talking with. Professor Ad Vingerhoetz, A D V I N G E R H O E T S dot com. We've got the links up, Ad Vingerhoetz dot com. You know, somebody just emailed me a few minutes ago, Professor, and said that when there's a troubling, I'm going to kind of condense it a little bit. When I have a troubling issue, et cetera, I have a good cry, then I feel better. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, our, our studies learn that it's, if people cry when they are alone and they do not receive support, and especially, also, especially in, in, in a laboratory setting. Huh? So if we expose people to a, a, a sad movie and uh, the, the, uh, the study participants is watching that movie in his own, and he doesn't re receive any response from the experimenter. In that case, without exception, all people felt worse after the movies. So, but it could be the case occasionally, if, if, if your 
a crying program, so to say, already runs, then it's difficult to stop your crying. Uh, and then it may be helpful maybe to, to let you go. And, and that, that has, because otherwise you, it, it costs a lot of effort to uh, inhibit the crying. Another comment, um, crying, definitely crying helps me. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of relief. Any thoughts? Um, it's it's certainly not a sign of weakness. Although although well, people feel that that's there. It had crying has a negative image. Generally speaking, and especially it depends a bit on the context, but especially in the work setting, it it has a very negative, uh, and, and people feel that 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 they are they show themselves as weak and so but um that's certainly not the case as i said we we often found that people who cry for a valid reason that that's very important huh? uh you you should cry for for a good reason uh, and in that case uh you can generally uh, count that you will receive very positive reactions from bystanders but i have to admit that um, that's one of the results of that uh, large international study. We also learned from that study that we prefer to cry when we are at home between, um, let's say, 7 and 11 p.m. and in the company of our romantic partners or our, uh, or our mother. So uh, especially those people from whom we expect uh, it's most likely that we will receive support. And so we don't like to cry in the presence of strangers. Um, and that, that then we want to withdraw, uh, especially in the work, work setting. Also. If you're going to cry, you, you go to the bathroom or something yeah, and yes, get away from people if you yeah, don't feel yeah. you can control it. Yes. Are there negative effects? Do you know if there are negative effects, Dr. Fingerhoitz, in trying to suppress tears, trying not to cry? You feel like it's coming. And I know for me, that never works. It's always, the more I try to push it down, I was telling you off air, I've said this a lot on the show, the more it comes out. Uh, do you know anything about like trying to suppress tears? I don't think that that has any effect. Uh, it, it's so seldom that we do it, it unless it's a it's it's a, a, a characteristic of a more general uh, tendency to suppress all your emotions, or, or for example, also not to share feelings with others, uh, to inhibit uh, to inhibit uh, the expression of emotions. That, then it's a, a completely different story. But if you focus on these, well, very rare moments that you want to suppress your tears, I don't think that that has any uh, negative effect. Again, you can, there's a lot more information at Professor Fingerhoitz's site, advingerhoitz.com. And you also your book, Adult Crying. We've talked yeah. about that, talking about adult crying. Yeah, our focus is is uh, completely on adult crying. Huh? So th there has been a great research on 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 the crying of infants, huh? but that that's not my uh, specialty. Sure. Uh, that's not my expertise. When I was talking we, again, talking earlier, what at this point after doing all the research and written all the books and been all the studies and all the media coverage of, of you and your work around literally around the world is there something at this point that still puzzles you about crying or weeping that you're looking yeah, at yeah yeah there are some i i would love to know more about uh, what's happening in the brain we don't know too much about that and also um well, the, there is some uh, mainly anecdotal evidence that people can uh, stop their crying, for example, after having experienced a traumatic experience. 
Uh, so um, it has been published in the literature. Uh, one of the victims who escaped the serial killer, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, mm -hmm. that he uh, could not cry. He lost the capacity to cry. And uh, oh. I, I, I also was once called by a woman who told me, uh, she said, uh, Dr. Vingroot, I have not cried since 22 years Then I had a stillbirth. And she said, is that, uh, is that a serious uh, is that a serious problem? I say, I don't know, I should ask you. And she said, well, for me, it's no problem unless there's something, there's a sad thing that happened in the family and everybody is crying and do, I do not show tears, then they consider me as callous and cold yeah. and, and yeah, yeah that, 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 that I don't like. Uh, um, so, but she said, generally speaking, it, it's no problem for me that I cannot cry. That's that's really interesting. When you think about some of the the things that you did with the the photographs and the emotions, um, empathy. Talk with us a little bit more about empathy, if you would. Yeah, um, our idea is that that uh, the mere sight of tears in in others, and especially, of course, if these others are intimates that that has a strong impact on your empathy and that that empathy subsequently uh, uh, well stimulates you to provide uh, comfort or help uh, to that person and um, well we have recently done another uh, international study in which we showed that uh, that this is a very uh, global a worldwide uh, effect. Uh, we, there were, uh, I think, participants from 41, uh, 41 countries all over the world. And uh, we again worked with pictures of crying people with visible tears and the same picture without visible tears. And um, what was also new in this uh, study that we added a context. So we had a positive context. So the, the, the person depicted on this picture uh, just heard from his uh, romantic partner that uh, he or she would end uh, the relationship. So that was a negative context. We had a positive context that the depicted person heard from others, from a, a romantic partner that he uh, he or she would propose her for marriage and a neutral content context that the depicted person was uh, um, uh, was cutting onions <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, that's, we so and that. that's great. To, to our surprise we, we we found such a strong effect of uh, of the sight of emotional tears even in the neutral setting so even when people we will cut onions with tears. Others are more willing to provide them for support and help than when they are cutting onions without uh, tears in their eyes. <laughs> so, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. It surprised you a lot? Uh, yeah, in some sense, initially, well, yeah, it did surprise me. But then if, if you sing then a moment, then you say, okay, yeah, we could have maybe have expected that. You know, it, Dr. Fingerhoes, it just made me think of a, um, of, I don't know if they call it mini series, a, a couple of episodes, few episodes of, of a show. I'm not going to go into it a lot, but the, the actors, uh, I found myself really emotionally involved in, and I would tear up, especially at a few scenes. There were some really tragic scenes where the actor or actress was tearing up and I felt myself tearing or they were crying i could feel myself tearing up that uh, that amazes me that people can they're great actors that they can make tears come out of their eyes they must be tapping a feeling and i don't know anything about acting they must be tapping a feeling with what i've read before for certain emotions yeah and then in yeah. me, even knowing they're acting you know yeah. knowing i'm watching a piece of fiction i mean i know it's made up if you will it's created it's not these 
this horrible stuff wasn't really happening yet it was so powerful emotionally that i started to tear up and even dropped a few tears yeah that, that's true that but that's also it seems to be one aspect of uh, uh, of empathy that we can yeah. uh, put ourselves in the shoes of others uh, so identification <laughs> with others and even if uh, if that other is the uh, a main character in a, in a novel or or, or in a movie uh, so that's not the real uh, not not in real life uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, but, but even also fantasy. And so the, the stronger we can identify as, ourselves with, with another, the more likely it is that we uh, are emotionally touched by what we uh, see. And again, that, that, that empathy, that emotionally touched by that is a good thing. I mean, it helps humanity. I, I understand if you, you know yeah, uh, empathy is is very important it, it's it's the basis of our you our human functioning i think uh, and and also yeah but it's closely related of course that that we are aware of the emotions of other and that we can understand that uh that another person is emotional and 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 the specific type of emotion that he or she experienced so that we can identify with him and and that's the best way also to help somebody if we understand what what the other person is feeling of course and what could be the reason for that feeling you know years ago and i probably said this to you years ago i would say empathetic people People want to know us, but they don't want to be us. And over the years, because it's, some, you know, it's, you feel, I, I hate to say too deeply sometimes or too quickly, yet as I've matured, I have started to think I wouldn't want to be without, I'd like to be able to control it a little bit. I still like to be able to, you know, control it a little bit, yet I wouldn't want to be without it. What kind of humans, and I know they're out there. That have no empathy, but yeah, there are you know, psychopaths and yeah. so uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But but what you see, what you talk about in in general, that when especially that holds for men, when when we grow older, we become yeah. more emotional. That's it. And yeah. and 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 in my case, I I think that I'm becoming more emotional when I witness positive acts and altruism of others than when yeah. I, I than when I witness uh, suffering of others t for some weird reason. I don't know if that uh, if other uh, people agree with me or do you recognize that by the way or I'm, I'm glad well I, I, I do um, and what I when I've realized that most recently is the and, and again, I'm not sure if it was because of COVID, because of the pandemic, and didn't see people as often, and weren't out and, and talking with people, certainly not, or my age, or a combination yeah. of the two. Again, I still feel that, you know, I still cry, I still feel that, that deep uh, sadness uh, when others are, are hurting. Nonetheless, I also have taken some great joy in seeing nice acts and just just you know politeness of somebody i mean they, they're not anything huge it's not like you know somebody um saved somebody's life that really i feel it it yeah. can be something as as minor as i'm really exposing myself here but they minor as i'm going in to get petrol i'm going to get gas pay for gas and a young man holds the door because he sees this old guy coming up and says, go ahead, sir. And it's like, I'm touched by that. Of course, I want to, yeah. I, I get in the conversation, want to know where they learned their manners and da 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 da. <laughs> I want to compliment them. Yet I'm really touched by this simple, yeah. really yeah. simple stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. it's, again, age or COVID or combination, because I've just started to recognize it over the last couple of years. Yeah, it's it's especially, I, th I think, uh, a phenomenon that we observe in the elderly. Um, 
and especially also what, what, what can even maybe uh, facilitate it is if people have experienced a, a serious uh, uh, life-threatening disease, for example, survivors of cancer or survivors oh. of a heart attack. Uh, a, a colleague of mine who worked a lot with uh, 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 cardiac patients, he, he told me that uh, one of his patients, uh, he was in a restaurant and they were having dinner and suddenly he had a, he burst out in tears and said, what's happening? What's going on? He said, I love the taste of the sauce. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. That's interesting. I, I, I kept, you know, I'm always, as we do with the right thinking ahead of something that, that I, that wouldn't have come to mind at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and also su survivors of cancer that they say from, well, before my cancer, I, I didn't have any, attention for for my environment and what was going on and now every nice flower that i come across that that wow. attracts my attention and and i appreciate it and so th th that kind of things and and especially also uh, music and uh, and uh, well things related to their grandchildren and, and so on that that become much more uh yeah it it, it has more power to uh to, to, to yeah to become emotional and to, you, to you, make you so how again with age again i and i, I know I'm, i see the email that, that that's not everybody some people become more curmudgeonly or nasty or I, and i get that but we're talking about and we certainly we understand that people that won't show empathy or don't seem to feel like you said psychopaths etc but when you see that with age what do you think what's your theory on that is it that because one thing pops into my mind and and i you know again you're the expert not me dr finger host but i'm thinking maybe because where we're at life and we're i dare say closer to the end we start to get a smaller things or different things we get a greater appreciation of i i don't know what yeah yeah well you you can, can think about explanations at, at different level levels huh? so uh, a, a mere physiological explanation is that it has to do with uh, uh with the lowering of, of your uh, testosterone in in the blood which so testosterone <laughs> Uh, uh, forgive it, me it, go, go ahead i'll tell you why i'm laughing go ahead yeah testosterone that's what we know that inhibits our crying so and when we grow older men grow yeah. older because that, that that's also fascinating we see this uh this becoming more emotional is is typically for men if we look at we, we don't have too much data about women but it seems that when we look at women that when they grow older either of three things can happen either they can become more emotional but also mm -hmm. uh, a third of them can becomes less emotional and a third group stays at the same level mm -hmm. whereas for for men nearly every without exception you see an increase in uh, in emotionality when men grow older that's interesting when you say about testosterone because a, a dear friend of mine always teases me uh, if I tear up or get emotional about something, it's because, and I stopped eating flesh meat in 1970 when I was in, in high school. So I, he says, I consume too much soy and there's estrogen, which of course studies show that that's not the case, that that doesn't lower testosterone or bring up estrogen levels in men. Nonetheless, he's always teasing. That's why I was laughing. He said, uh -huh. you, you get emotional because you eat too much soy, <laughs> tofu, et cetera. But again, the that aging process, and that makes sense about the testosterone uh, lowering. But but you, yeah, that that so but that's just one physiological explanation. You you can also speculate that it's more a psychological explanation that you become aware that what's going on in the world becomes more important for your genes. So you have children and grandchildren. So, uh, so more generally speaking, you see that when we develop from an infant, infants are very egocentric. So 
they they're just crying for what happens for what happens to themselves and and then their world becomes a bit larger right? initially just their parents and what we, is what you we see is that for example uh I think is an impressive example that uh, children who have cancer that they don't want to cry in the presence of their father or mother wow. because they are aware if I cry then my mother or father crying. also starts crying. And so, wow. and 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 then when we grow older, yeah, our, our world expands, and and with children and grandchildren, we are maybe aware that that our genes. So uh, it is are expanding, and so what's going on in the world is is extremely important for for our offspring. That's interesting when you say that. We got uh, actually a couple of emails on testosterone. I haven't had a chance to open them all, but the um, and I'm wondering with this one gentleman that said about testosterone that his testosterone levels are normal, yet he's very emotional. And I'm thinking I had to have, I had, I shouldn't get into this, uh, a, a lot of blood work uh, over the last year. And uh, my testosterone levels came up as normal. And I'm wondering if that's age related. I'm guessing it's got to be that if you're in your 70th year, the, the normal range of testosterone, I've got to look this up and research it a little bit, would be lower because of your age the you know yeah, yeah. they're not going to say it within normal ranges for a 20 year old is the same as someone in their 70th year of course yeah, no no not necessarily yeah and so yeah and and maybe you have i'm not sure about that though but i can imagine that uh there are oh, yeah. relatively large in the individual differences so yeah, everybody has his own specific level of testosterone so um but generally speaking we know that when we become older uh, men became older that their testosterone level uh, show a decrease yeah. and uh, well we also know for example if uh, uh, men with prostate cancer when they receive anti-hormones that uh, lowers their uh, uh, testosterone even more then you see that they also become more emotional and uh, that's interesting and, and and the same we see for transgenders. If if a man turns into a woman as soon as the the testosterone levels uh, go down, then they become more emotional. And the other way around, if a woman turns into a a man as as soon as the testosterone levels go up, then you see that drugs yeah. it causes a, a decrease in their emotionality. Well, that's interesting. I, I, I'm delighted, Dr. Vingerhoes, that your work is so is so international, and people want to know. Because when you and I first spoke, I wasn't aware of anybody doing that the kind of research. I mean, we've spoken many times since, but I think it's I find it to be so interesting and so important to understand that it helps us understand ourselves and yeah, society. I, uh, yeah. Yeah, I I think that yeah that that's a major lesson that it, it's very important. More generally speaking, that we know more about our emotions and the function of emotions. Um, emotions have a bad reputation. We think that they are most uh, uh, the source of all kind of problems uh, in inter in interpersonal functioning. But reality is that emotions help us to to uh, respond in an optimal way to uh, uh, for us very important situations so uh, not just uh, it's not just a, a matter of survival for uh, especially anxiety that helps us to prepare our bodies that uh, for the fight or flight reaction that it's more easy to uh, uh, it produces energy that that it's more easy for us to escape uh, a danger, a threatening situation. Uh, 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 another nice example is, I think, uh, physical disgust. 
which is caused by all kinds of uh, situations like uh, any hygienic uh, situations, uh, bodily fluids of others, decaying processes and so on. But what these situations have in common that it's rather likely that we are exposed to uh, uh, microorganisms that make made us sick. Uh, so, so it really prevents us from becoming uh, infected with. Um, but then, in addition to survival, uh, uh, emotions like uh, guilt and regret and, and more remorse and, and shame, they are help us to better functioning in a social context. These emotions are very important. If I uh, show that I'm guilty, you are more willing to forgive me and that we uh, can can continue uh, uh, without, uh, uh, well, we try to leave the past behind and, and we can continue. Uh, and, and also for our uh, uh, moral functioning. Huh? So if you look at, uh, for example, anger, especially the empathic anger, so not, not the anger that we experience when uh, something, someone is doing something to us, blocks our uh, our uh, goals or so, but what's going on in the world. Uh, so uh, I'm angry at uh, what's happening in Ukraine yeah. and, and so okay. on. Yeah. Uh, and, and also uh, feelings like elevation and moral disgust. Uh, so uh, what you do, that behavior, that awful behavior that uh, I despise that behavior. So, so it, it really helps us to, uh, well, maybe even for the development of our moral compass. It's an interesting hypothesis. I, uh, I, I find your work, Professor Fingerhoves, absolutely fascinating. And the more studies and the more I read and the more we talk and the, the, the more so, the more so I'm just so grateful, grateful for what you do in the world and all the studies you've done and all the books you've written. Again, it's advingerhoetz.com, A-D-V-I-N-G-E-R-H-O-E-T-S.com. Got that linked up at louisfreeshow.com and wfmj.com. I'm just, and I love that your research and passion for your work continues. Uh, um, thank you very much for uh, for these very nice words. I'm, I'm feeling a bit embarrassment. <laughs> well, <laughs> so embarrassment. Where does that, we could get into a whole thing about where embarrassment comes from? But there, it's 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 accurate. You know, I, again, I'm not being argumentative with you. You're saying kind words. They're accurate accurate words. I like to think of myself as kind. Yes, but I'm not saying it so that you know, to heap praise on you that where there's no, nothing to back it. It's, it's 100% accurate. The more I've read about your works and the studies and the books and our conversations, I'm just taken by your work and grateful as somebody who's emotional cry for all of us, or, or if you're not. And again, like you were saying about that, I, I'm not sure the term you used, um, empathetic anger, was it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that's it fascinates me. So many of the things that, that you bring up and talk about, and I just think your creativity and then your drive to find answers and learn more is just important for our world. And and that you put up with me and my madness and my chaos and everything and still come back on the show. I'm personally <laughs> grateful for that. I think that we have that in common. Our gales. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I hope you'll do you, we'll do it again in the future. Professor. Okay, of course you're always welcome. I appreciate. Uh, I really loved chatting with you. Yeah. Thank you, as I do with you. It's my honor, uh, Professor A D Binger. Oh, it's A D V I N. Thanks, Professor V I N G E 